How about we move on to something more academical? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, so all of us are very glad to witness your tremendous efforts in two different fields, analysis and number theory. So these two fields are considered the most challenging fields uh, to most undergraduates, including my students. So all of them, <laughs> most of them <laughs> face difficulty when learning, you know, when writing a proof or yeah. when doing something in number theory. So uh, you are very strong in these two aspects. Uh, so what motivates you to pursue an academic career in these two mathematical disciplines? So, as I mentioned, <coughs> as a graduate student, I went to Stanford to work in logic because I wanted to work with this fellow and he I was see. very famous for doing foundations I see. and uh, foundations of math. And when I got there, he said he's interested in problems around number theory and that, with, with that in an instant, that became what I was got interested in. And as I mentioned, and this uh, was really important for me, was by learning with him a third person subject, uh, the work of Selberg, yeah. which was, uh, who was sort of the leading person who could marry analysis and number theory in exactly. very deep ways. Uh, I became an expert at that field and you, and you study the original. I should say, uh, this is just a remark which I like to make, to, especially to students, is you may, uh, if you want to understand mm. something, go study the original, the way it was invented. Don't read some modern treatment sure. because that's too slick, Classical it's too paper. clever. Yeah. You go read, you see, if you read the slick one, you, you're sitting there in the class and it is so clever and you think, how could I ever have come up with this? Because yeah. the reason it's so clever is because it's been shined and polished and shined and polished to something very beautiful, but you don't see how it got there. If you go and see the originator, how the person invented it, you'll see it's rough, it's not clean, but you can see that, ah, that's how that person got that. And then everything starts to look much more natural. Of course, there are going to be some steps that are really unexpected. People are geniuses. They come with some really uninspired step, yeah. but you can see that it's an analytic continuation, as right. you might say in mathematics. Right. And it kind of flows and you can feel, ah, I could see how that is. So you go to the original and you learn it there. It can be extremely, uh, it's a much better way to learn. So always study the masters. And that's what I did. I studied Selberg's work I see. very closely and began to understand how he came up with these ideas. And then through that, I became an expert in automorphic forms, number theory, analysis. And once you become an expert at something, you sort of know all the tricks that most people know. And then you can try add your, you can try solve a problem by add, be, do, do something inspired, maybe with collaborations. And that formed my, uh, let's say, expertise in this area. Mm. But I've never understood people who stay in one field. I mean, if you're lucky enough to work in mathematics right. for a long time, you know, as I said, you're frustrated and you stuck most of the time. But at some point, you start to generate the same ideas. Yeah. And you, at some point, you begin to realize you've kind of saturated. You're not, <laughs> you, you, you need to move on somewhere else and then maybe come back. Right. Never forget what you've right. done. And. Uh, I think it's quite natural that one evolves and starts looking at nearby fields. And to me, m many of the best successes I've had have come through mistakes. Mm. You sort of misunderstand something maybe in another field and then the misunderstanding actually leads you to something that's different to what everybody else is doing. So it's very important to expose yourself to errors, errors yeah. <laughs> in your thinking yeah. because you might do something a little different. Yeah. And you become expert at something and then you kind of like venture out into a nearby field and then come back and, but you have the area that you're an expert. And from whatever successes I've had, many of them are by marrying fields. In other words, say, um, uh, Ralph Phillips, uh, who was a professor at Stanford, much older than me, a teacher of mine who I worked with a lot. And, um, Alex Lubotsky uh, and I wrote some paper in, um, so this is maybe relevant if we get to any of the math, uh, 
where we use some number theory to construct graphs that are combinatorially very sparse mm -hmm. but also very connected. So you could imagine something that's both connected and sparse is very useful, very in, useful. in computer science, computer engineering, science, in, any, in any crypto analysis. Right. And that's true. And the, so there are these graphs called expanders mm -hmm. that people were trying to construct. Yeah. And we showed how to make the very best. You cannot do them any better. So they call, we call them Ramanujan graphs. And they are used left, right, and center. Uh, computer scientists, scientists describe them as a gift from math to computer science. Yeah. And that discovery uh, was by connecting two areas. You're mm -hmm. using number theory, to, really mainstream number theory, to construct these objects in computer science. And the subject, in this way, the information was going from number theory to computer science. But later in the work that's cited in the Shaw Prize, actually we use ideas from computer science to, to do number theory. Oh, so, and the ideas are connected with this expansion. Yeah. So when you connect two fields mm. and it's successful, often you, you connect what you have a problem here and you reinterpret it in another yeah. language, it's just as difficult in both languages. But when you do see that it makes progress, then the interplay, the information, can be really big going back and forth, and the two fields can gain dramatically. Sure. And that, that kind of uh, success is, uh, if one is lucky enough to have it, is very, yeah. very rewarding. Yeah. So maybe I add a bit comment yeah. to what you have mentioned just now. So as a scholar, I think it's very important to learn from mistakes and, uh, you know, go to another field. And then, you know, when you did something in another field, maybe that will be applicable to your original problem. Uh, that's what I always experience because I start from a problem in daily life and then I use different mathematical tools. Yeah. So if this tools doesn't work and then I try to use other tools like, uh, you know, numerical scheme, and then if not numerical scheme doesn't work, maybe I think about the uh, PDD itself yes. uh, that governs the natural phenomenon. So uh, the model. Yeah, so, so it's very interesting. And one thing I totally fascinated from what you said, because you mentioned if we want to investigate a problem, we need to go back to the classics. Yes. That's very important, which I, I think nowadays uh, is a very useful and uh, commendable advice to the next generation because some of them maybe nowadays they read some notes uh, from professors <laughs> and uh, or even you know they search for the yeah, information for it, yeah. from the chat GPT yeah, right yeah. Uh, but they forgot the historical development and advancement yeah, right. of mathematics so as you mentioned just now you talk about your short price pieces and yes. you mentioned you connect mathematics with computer science. Yes. Uh, so I also know that you have connected analytic number theory with uh, different fields like, you know, theoretical physics, spectral theory, and uh, even dynamical system yes. and the fin groups that you, <laughs> yeah. that you have uh, been well known right. for us and uh, which are more applying computational in general because uh, imagine you have uh, analytic number theory, which is very pure in nature but spectral theory and dynamical system are very applied. Right. So how could you elaborate a bit on how do you find a synergy between. in between these two different areas or you know, across the disciplines in mathematics, which I'm sure all the audience would like to know. Yes, yes. So, um, uh, let me quote Atiyah, a very famous yeah. mathematician who um, hopefully many people might have heard of. Uh, he said, there's math, there's geometry, there's this, there's physics, and but the final frontier yeah. is number theory. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and you might ask, why is number theory yeah. all of a sudden applied? Uh, and the reason is because of the computer. computer. Everything is discrete. Right. And once you get to discrete problems, you have to work with whole numbers. And number theory is the study of whole numbers which are much harder to study than real numbers because real numbers are in, an invention. Yeah. And they invented so that you get enough numbers to, to solve equations. While in number theory, it's very, very subtle yeah. whether you can solve an equation in integers, extremely tricky. The problems are very easy to state, mm. but it's v very hard to solve. So okay, it's exactly. very attractive that you can quickly understand what the problem is 
Uh, you don't need to know much, but then the most sophisticated mathematics is being used to try and understand the problem. Mm -hmm. So with, when, say, Gauss, who was invented much of math modern yeah. mathematics, one of the greats, um, his view, he invented number theory also. He was sort of maybe the father of number theory. He wrote a, a book that's, usually, as I said, we go back and you read this question is arithmetic eye and you'll see how he thought of things. As a 17-year-old, Gauss, year yeah. Old, yeah. So Gauss uh, called it the queen of mathematics. Right. Because he didn't view it as ever going to be ever useful. Very talented. Yeah. Uh, but beautiful, absolutely yeah. the queen, beautiful, math beauty galore, hmm. but useless. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was quite wrong. Right. Because, and it, that's because of the modern computer and because of the digital world. Number theory is becoming one of the most applied areas in cryptography, in yeah. um, public key cryptography, in quantum computation. Quantized, you're already discrete again. Yeah. So it's not surprising maybe that in the end, if you start studying a problem and you want to really understand the fine structure and the depth of what's really going on, it might eventually be a problem in number theory. And in my mm. career, there have been some instances of that. So you mentioned physics. Yep. So there are problems in physics, foundations uh, of quantum mechanics, of how you write down quantum mechanics. Uh, and the way uh, Heisenberg and uh, Schrodinger wrote down the equations that Bohr could only do um, by his orbital method. He, he didn't, but he didn't. He couldn't quantize helium, for example. <laughs> yeah. So people, uh, when once quantum mechanics was invented, then there was a really interesting questions about the relation between classical mechanics and quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. semi-classics as we call it, and. The fine structure, the fine questions there that people started to ask in the 70s and 80s about quantizing a chaotic system right. are so subtle that, um, in in terms of mathematically understanding them, numerically you can try and understand them, but mathematically to prove anything, and it turned out that there are mechanical systems, uh, Hamiltonian systems that come from the theory of modular forms, which right. is what I work in. Exactly. And in that setting, when you ask these questions of quantum chaos, my collaborators and I realized that the central problems in number theory are completely tied to these questions that are being asked in quantum chaos. So it's like, it was like made to, to be looked at. And that is a subject that I called arithmetic quantum chaos. Right. That is still very active and it's one of, it's like a chaotic system, you quantize it and you can really analyze it precisely because it's got a number theoretic interpretation. Mm. And it's not silly number theory questions you're asking. The central ones are, are relevant to understanding the problem. To understand yeah. the problem. So when you see that, you realize that it's not you inventing it. It's, it's there. It's clever. It was the there. You just, you just, yeah, yeah. nature. Na you, you just found it. It's happening in yeah. nature, and uh, it depends on who to discover the relationship and connections in between. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that, so it turns out that number theory is much more applied. Right. 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 Than, and right. this is something that, of course, every time somebody, if I'm lucky enough to have found something like that, it's something I rejoice in, because my expertise from the early was the number theory. I see. But in the end, um, I'm interested in problems, as I said, and uh, the problems are what drive very, mathematics. Very, interesting. Yeah. The, very, very the, interesting. The most important. They're basic problems that are good, and that somehow uh, the greats like Gauss, Riemann raised, and we still haven't been able to answer them, yeah. many of them. And those are the problems that drive the subject for good reason, because they, well, you could argue that, you know, anybody can ask many mm. questions, but they are stupid questions and they're great <laughs> questions. Sure. And the, the great questions are the ones that drive the subject for me. So I think uh, I can describe it using a sentence. Maybe God creates the stage for us. Uh, yes. And uh, we are the people and we are the group of, uh, you know, we are the group of scholars to discover the nature and uh, to look at the relationship in between. Yes. And uh, we try to make more contributions starting from the beginning and uh, which could eventually, you know, uh, contribute to different perspective right. of our daily life.